Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Mesoamerica, right? So that's kind of more of your specialty anyway. I, I'm, I yes, sir. was amazed at our last conversation about Egypt. I thought that really went fantastic. Well, so thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Appreciate that, all that's you. the first time that I've ever, you know, expressed my points on, on Egypt in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It was fascinating. I think the audience will find it fascinating as well. So thank you. Um, yeah. Mesoamerica. So Mesoamerica is essentially where the Mexican Valley begins. So you have Mexican Valley civilization. That's Teotihuacan. That's where the Aztecs were at. That's where the Toltecs were at. It's around modern day Mexico City. So Mexico City has been inhabited for as long as we know as Mexico City has, has existed since forever, essentially. Mesoamerica follows that all the way down into, let's say, halfway through Honduras, El Salvador. Um, that's Mesoamerica. Ancient South America, ancient Andean culture is what we would refer to as the Inca. And it's not just the Inca. It's it's uh, it's the Inca, the Chavin culture, the Moche culture, the Caral Supe culture. It, th those are two different worlds that I suspect have an ancient, uh, like an even more ancient connection between each other. But that's Meso so Mesoamerica is your uh, Toltecs, Teotihuacanos, Olmecs, Aztecs, Maya, Zapotecs. South America is Inca plus all of the others. Mm -hmm. So um, Central America, Mesoamerican ancient history has been my specialty and my uh, uh, place of interest for about three years now. I, I've been really looking to, into it, always had been interested in it, but um, you know, I spent several years diving deeply into ancient Egypt. And then at the time, I just wasn't quite old enough to travel on my own yet. And Mexico was more accessible to me, so I started looking into ancient Mexico, which expanded into all of Mesoamerica slash Central America. So, um, yeah, man, I mean, it's it's a it's a whole world that is complicated beyond anything that old world archaeologists uh, would understand at first glance. Like in our last podcast, we talked about the lineages of kings um, of dynastic Egypt that go from Scorpion II. Um, and then that, or Scorpion the second, and then that ends with Cleopatra's death. She is the final pharaoh uh, of of Egypt, and it's one straight lineage. There's a couple times that, or a few times that that Egypt is taken over by foreign rulers, but for the most part, it's a straight shot in rulers. Mesoamerica is not that way. When we refer to the Maya, what we refer to is kind of a really, really incredibly large region that encompasses the Yucatan of Mexico, Campeche, Chiapas, Tabasco, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, this vast area that where people spoke similar languages, uh, there's actually 27 different Maya, ancient Maya languages. Wow. Um, but they, but they used the same form of writing, which is really interesting. So the language in which they wrote in is different in the language that they spoke in. So they could write documents that all of them could read. It's really interesting. Um, but they didn't see themselves as a unified nation, say, a unified nation as a, uh, that opposed themselves to Teotihuacan or something like that. Each city in the Maya world acted as a city-state. It represented itself that had its own kings and royal families. So you have... I mean, almost an infinite amount of Maya cities. I could go on and on and on and on and name them. And in the Maya world, it wasn't easy to travel around. You know, um, in, in ancient Greece and Egypt, it's a straight shot to get to wherever you want to go. But in the Maya world, you have to traverse through jungles, which is full of mountains, uh, cliffs that you can't see. There's not that many rivers there either. You would think of the jungles and, and in these tropical areas, there'd be a lot of rivers. There's not. There's only a few rivers. So it's dense, Snake. dense jungles, snakes, yep. uh, snakes, jaguars, um, uh, wild hogs, other, you know, um, in the Maya people, they had to deal with, uh, sort of uncontacted tribes as well. There are people mm -hmm. just living in the jungle that will attack you, you know, mm -hmm. um, very, very dense. So, you know, it's kind of like living on the other side of a mountain from somebody. You're only a mile away from them, but you're really a world away. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, that was a problem in navigating the Maya world. And so people end up building their own kingdoms in the city that they live in and they have their own kings. So 
Whereas somebody spends their entire career studying all of ancient Egypt and all of the different lineages of kings, another person could spend their entire career studying the city-state of Yashilan and all of its kings. And just, you know, 15 miles down the river, there's a place called Piedras Negras, which was a like a sister city that lived along the same river that has its own lineage of kings. 15 more da- miles down the river, there's another one. You zoom out of all of Mesoamerica, there's thousands. Mm. So <laughs> that's crazy. You're talking about you're talking about an insanely dense history. Um, the Maya world was so big that you know, imagine all the movies that we have of of the medieval times in England, and you know, imagine all the millions of people that lived in that er- in those areas, and how complicated the relationships were between the ruling class and the peasants and the middle class and the ruling class between other between other cities and nations the maya world had three times as many people as medieval as as medieval europe three times as many so you're talking about insanely complex society insanely advanced society very knowledgeable with with a written language and um, knowledge of the stars that far exceeded anywhere any evidence that we have that the ancient Egyptians knew, um, or that the ancient Egyptians were aware of or had risen to. It, it's just, it is a, um, it's a bottomless pit of information to to dive into, and unfortunately, we're so disconnected from it because when the Spaniards first arrived in the Americas. Well, they really had two prerogatives. One was to convert um, people to Christianity, you know, uh, Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't their main prerogative. And they did that by... Well, they did that by torturing people and, right. uh, yeah, yeah. They and, did that by, by torturing people and burning their history to the ground right. to eliminate all of their culture to get them to convert. But really what Spain wanted was absolute control over the area. So although they, although they disguised it in the form of, well, we're getting rid of all of these people's demonic culture and the, all of their demonic gods and we're going to introduce them to uh, we're going to introduce them to Catholicism, convert them. Well, sure, they wanted them converted, but really they wanted subjects and people to work for the Spanish crown. Because Spain, the reason that they went back to the Americas and took all these voyages and invested the money in in uh, basically building up what they called New Spain was because Spain was hurting economically. Fewer people than ever were going to church at this time. And so... They needed to extrapolate all of the wealth from the New World and convert all of these people to work for the Spanish crown, you know, sending food over, harvesting crops. They basically needed to enslave all of the Maya, Aztec, Inca, all of the people that they, that they encountered. And so the easiest way of, of foiling a rebellion is to destroy all of their cultural history. So we'll get, we'll get further into this, but... Um, <clears throat> What they essentially did, and there's a guy named Diego de Landa in the mid-1500s, he gathered all of the Maya people. Now, he's in the Yucatan in a city called Merida. And he gathers all of the Maya people, thousands of them, from from you know from the coastal Maya regions to as far into the jungle as he could. He gathered all of them. And he sent out a decree for all of them to go and gather all of their written documents and bring them back to Merida. He made it sound like it was going to be, you know, for something productive for the Maya people. But really what he did was he assembled pyres, which are mounds, but a pyre is larger than a mound. So we're talking maybe more than floor to ceiling. Imagine the amount of information you could gather about ancient Egypt in books that went from floor to the ceiling, in a pile of books that went from floor to ceiling. And then imagine you have multiple of them and you burn all of them. And Maya books were incredibly dense with information. So they were codices. Uh, so a codis is, is imagine a book is actually one piece of paper and it's folded back and forth, kind of like sticky notes, how you mm-hmm. pull them out. That's a, co- that's a codis or a codex. That, can't, that comes from the Maya world. And so they had 2,000 years of written history uh, of in, in, in insanely, I mean, it, the detail that that the Maya people go into is is, in my opinion, just far beyond any place that you see in the ancient world. Like, for a long time, people would look at uh, these ancient Maya temples, and they would wonder, like, 
uh, a lot of times the measurements of the of the walls of Maya temples in the back side of the walls would be um, they would be uneven, but they would be intentionally uneven because you could see that the wall was once in, in a place that it's not anymore. And people always wondered, like, you know, why are all these temples, they look like they're constructed proportionately. They're also constructed according to uh, sacred ge uh, geometrical measurements as well. Mm -hmm. And now what we're learning because of the uh, because of the decipherment of the Dresden Codex. So the Dresden Codex was one of four codices or codexes um, that survived from the Maya world of hundreds of thousands that were burned. And of this four, of this one codex, we have learned, we've learned enough information about Maya astronomy to fill up books that are this thick, wow. this big. And, and that, and I, and the reason I say it is because I have the book and it says, it says the foundations of Mesoamerican astronomy. That's just the foundation of it. That comes from a codex that's like uh, as long as from here from here to Ryan, and um, and so that's how densely they would write into the into their codices. So now what we've learned because of what we found on their codices and because of the constellations that they that they recognize. What we learn when we stand in their, what we learn when we stand in their temples, and then the trees are cleared out around the temples. The reason that the inside of the temples were the walls were slightly changed, things were slightly pushed over. They would remove a wall and then rebuild it and rebuild the ceiling on top of it, is because they were trying to perfect the alignment to astronomical bodies in the sky back when they had had the uh, back when they had the jungles cut down. So when the, when the jungle is growing all over a temple and you're like looking at the size of the temple trying to figure out why it looks like it's adjusted, it's because you can't see the way the sun falls into the temple during mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. You can't see where the moon rises in front of the temple. But when you clear it, clear out all the jungle, you can see. And it took a long time for people to realize because all of the Maya cities are in the jungle in the, you know the jungle foliage grows and covers up the sky. All of Maya, all of the Maya cities are built accord, aligned to astronomical bodies in the sky. It's crazy. But it, you have to remove the jungle to be able to see that. Right. And so, man, I've just gone down this rabbit hole that is deeper than I could possibly imagine. And and uh, and it'll take me a decade to get like a good uh, to get. I mean, I have a good grasp on it, but it'll take me a decade just to get to where I want to be and everything that there is to know. It it yeah. it, it goes. Uh, in some ways, so much deeper than even ancient Egypt does. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, it hasn't been popularized yet. Right, right. You know? yeah. The Aztecs have been writing for 100, 150 years before the Spanish arrived. The The Maya had been writing for 2,000 years, God. and all of that was burned up. Mm -hmm. So the Maya, my opinion, absolutely, they knew, they knew about the Olmecs. Um, they probably knew about their history prior to the Olmecs. It was probably written down, and it's all just vapor now just lost yeah, it, yeah it's all just lost so getting uh getting to the olmecs so the olmecs are the oldest most ancient mesoamerican civilization that we are aware of yeah I um, feel like there's such a lack of information about the olmecs and like there's such a, there's so much interesting things that we can see that came from that that civilization yeah. and and we just don't it's not really talked about nearly as much as Aztecs or well, Mayans. yeah. And what I don't understand about that is is it's not as it's not as talked about as the Aztecs and the Maya, but the Aztecs and the Maya don't really have prominent megaliths. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have megalithic monuments that took an insane amount of of labor force and and, and engineering to be able to accomplish. That's not seen anywhere in the Aztec world. The Aztec world is actually so small that you can't Google what an Aztec pyramid looks like because they were destroyed and there weren't that many of them to begin with. But you can find Olmec pyramids, um, even though they're not stone, they're like earthen pyramids, but you find tons of Maya pyramids. But I'm just saying it's it's interesting that it is so seldom uh, shed light upon, you know? Yeah. And so um, so the the really strange thing about the Olmecs is it's the first time that we see a rise of civilization in ancient Mesoamerica. It's also the place that we find the largest monuments in all of the Americas. The largest, uh, 
effigies, I should say. So like an effigy is, is a, a depiction of a person or a thing or a God or something like that. Um, you know, in Sakse Waman, we see lots of giant megalithic stones, but we don't see these, you know, if you were to carve that stone into a face, it'd now be an effigy, right? Mm -hmm. It's the largest, most megalithic effigies found anywhere on the planet. And it happens right at the beginning of, of Mesoamerican, uh, Mesoamerican history. And there's not even an adequate explanation for that. Like, like how I can kind of justify a little bit an explanation where when people say, well, Egyptian, massive megalithic Egyptian art kind of starts right off at the beginning, I can go, eh, well, kind of, but there's really like, 700 years of documented history leading up to that and then it's got this exponential growth in the, in mesoamerica you're starting up here from the very beginning right. from the very beginning yeah. there's not even evidence of a gradual increase at all from the very beginning they're taking 50 ton stone blocks transporting the block over 50 to 100 miles through jungle uh, through jungle mountains, well, they're like they're like volcanic mountains, jungle, and then through rivers, and you have to sail it down a river to get to its place. And then when it gets to its location, they then carve the basalt monuments into whatever they intend for it to be. Yeah, and so it's like the Egypt. It's the same the mystery with Egypt. How did they move? Yeah. The, how did they move those huge blocks? Well, in in some cases, the um, in some cases, some of those blocks in Egypt come from deep in the deserts east of uh or deep in like the mountain hills um east of aswan and they bring they would bring down this red granite and uh diorite stones from there bring it down to aswan through the mountains and then sail it north to the giza plateau i would you know i yeah. when when i think about like a giant riverboat being able to just touching on egypt for just a second when i think about a giant riverboat if if we were to be able to place a giant oh sorry if we were to be able to place a giant granite block on perfectly in the center of one of those river boats maybe the boat could carry it mm. maybe how do you get it onto the boat without sinking the boat though right right, right. <laughs> you know without just tipping the boat over and, and i i don't i just don't know i yeah. have i have literally no idea yeah it's a huge it's a huge problem it's oh a huge, huge problem yeah. yeah and the fact that a lot of Egyptologists and and uh, you know your mainstream traditional archaeologists kind of brush it off. Yeah. For yeah. what reason? I have no idea. You know, why can't you just admit it's a it's a mystery? It's a mystery that we can't solve. Yeah. And when I see huge problems like that, like my my bullshit meter just goes through the roof. You know, it's like okay, well, how much of this story can we really believe as fact? If you know one of if if the major you know if if this part of the story yeah. is so hard to believe, how can we really buy into the rest of it? And then yeah, and I think that's where you know people get interested in how old could these things be? You can't they oh yeah them, yeah you know? like yeah yeah absolutely. Well, and um, <clears throat> so. As I've as I've said a couple times, my professor, Dr. Ed Barnhart, he worked with a uh, he worked with a nautical engineer down in Tabasco, uh, Mexico, and Veracruz, Mexico, and they built a formula where you could plug in your theoretical size of an Olmec head and your theoretical size of a balsa river raft, and balsa is that is a common type of wood that's down there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the theory is that, is that they transported these heads and altars on balsa rafts. So Dr. Barnhart was like, I wonder how big you would have to make the raft to be, to carry these things. So his friend created the algorithm and he found out that if you made the balsa logs bigger than balsa trees are, so impossibly large balsa logs, and you made them 50 by 50 foot across so large that it couldn't actually navigate down down the uh, uh, Quetzalcoatlcos River. Um, it could it couldn't sail down the river. If you placed a five ton Olmec head on the raft, it would sink the raft. But the smallest head is six tons. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it, there's a huge huge mystery there. Yeah. And on top of that, the largest head, the La Cobada head, is forty two tons, and it's. 11 and a half feet tall. Right. So it's just um, how these things were transported, nobody knows. And like yeah. I was telling you yesterday, yeah, it's, it's not only that some of these heads are, are 42, 42 tons, they were once bigger because it was a solid piece of stone that was carved into an altar. Right. And then the altar is carved into a head. Right. You know, right. so, I mean, you're talking about 
you're getting well north of 50 tons, yeah. 50 tons yeah. that they're, that they're moving right. and, and it's basalt. So it's, so, you know, if it were granite, it could be smaller, right. but basalt is, it, it's, there, these are huge monuments yeah. Yeah. and, uh, totally inexplicable yeah. how they were transported. Um, in the Olmec world is also, I'll pull it up here. Um, and, and were the heads found underground for the most part? Yeah. So these right here, um, I believe this is uh, Jose Maria who's standing next to him. He found the very first Olmec head in the the late 1800s, I believe. Uh -huh. um, and then it wasn't, I believe this is like 1925, 1926 that an archaeologist came and actually excavated it. But, um, but he dug it out from underground. Yeah, he dug it out from under, from underground. They were all buried. Yeah. And the I and I you know I guess there was obviously experts who can go and you know they slice out a, a piece of the soil and look at it and they're able to tell when something is purposely you know buried. I, I guess. And um, so yeah, these were purposefully buried. And and yeah, so there there's the BS meter again. Going yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because it's like I mean, and maybe it's true. I mean, but but again, a lot of like we we thought that Gebekli Tepe was was purposely buried, mm -hmm. and now a lot of the stuff's coming out and saying you know maybe it wasn't. You know, a lot of the really really old stuff that we think was purposely buried, like the the um, Easter Island. You know, was that really purposely buried? You know, yeah. And so and so potentially could could have if if there was some major flood where you had all this mud that mm -hmm. that was you know that was flowing over the land that. That, that could that make it look as if it was purposely buried? Would mm -hmm. would would the would the dig look the same? Well, I I, I honestly don't know. Um, <clears throat> probably a geologist might be able to answer that better yeah. than me. Yeah. Um, there I'm sure there's archaeologists out there that could that could answer that better. But you know, another reason that I think that we don't really have revelations in the way that we think about Mesoamerica mm -hmm. is because the funding isn't there. Mm -hmm. It has to be popular for it to get the funding. Right. Rebecca Tepe is an insanely popular site. Therefore, research is going and going and going at this site. Nobody cares about the Olmec heads, right. you know? Right. Um, and it's not popular, you know, it's popular in Mexico, mm -hmm. but the Western audience is what determines where the world goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody's really looking at the Olmec heads. So yeah. there's no incentive for, this might be um, a La Venta head. And La Venta is the property of La Vinta, where the city was found, it's currently be, it's currently owned by an oil company. And so an oil company has that land. So nobody has excavated that land oh. in uh, like, I think nearly a hundred years. Really? They, they moved the monuments to a, uh, to a park in Villahermosa, Mexico, but the land is still owned by an oil company mm -hmm. and nobody's going out there to excavate. And Maybe if there was enough money and there was enough uh, interest in it that, you know, something could be talked, you know, yeah. they could be talked into letting people come in and research the site. Nobody is excavating this area. Wow. And that's only, that's one of only three major Olmec cities that we know about. So that's 33% of the Olmec world is off limits. And wasn't that the capital or what we think is the capital was La Venta? Yeah. Well, it seems like the civilization moved. So you have uh, San Lorenzo, Tres Sapotes, and La Venta. And yeah. I believe San Lorenzo is the beginning. Then they moved to Tres Sapotes. Then they moved to La Venta. Okay. And uh, so it doesn't seem like uh, that they were all operating at the exact same time because the bones are, are the bones are different ages. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, yeah, it's it's really strange. Um, there's a lot of mysteries. Like if you look at the, uh, if you look at the marks that are on top of the head, we don't know if that was from tribes who were coming in trying to deface the monument yeah, yeah. or maybe it was buried and, uh, and only the, only the top of the head was showing and people were trying to scrape at it for some reason. Cause that's a helmet. That's not hair. Yeah. 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 It's a helmet. Right. They've never found these helmets. What's really interesting is just like yeah. Egyptian hats, like the, the head, the head, yeah, the, the head uh, or head yeah, the head yeah. And uh, and the Egyptian, like the long flowing, not just the crowns, but like the hats that they would wear, the long right. flowing hats, those have never been found. These Olmec helmets have never been found yeah. either. So that's another argument that potentially, potentially older, you know, potentially. Potentially some and, kind and, of connection, and, yeah. And, and the bones that were found in Leventa, I mean, is it possible, and, and in the other um, cities, is it possible mm -hmm. that, that that was just a later civilization that went and lived at the spot that the Olmecs had it's, had... Um, it's tough to say because uh, these are column tombs, and uh, so each of these columns weigh about uh, weigh about two tons a piece. And so we know 
that Olmec kings that lived three to 4,000 years ago were buried within these column tombs. Whoever moved these column tombs, whoever moved these big columns, was mining the exact same places in the Veracruz volcanic belt as where the Olmec heads come from. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of things that are tying the people of the time to the monuments. Um, but the really interesting thing is this guy right here. The very first depiction of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god of Mesoamerica, is depicted holding a man who is carrying a handbag, just like we see in South America, like we see in Gobekli Tepe, and I think arguably there are other places in the world as well. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that, like I was telling you yesterday, when I look at ancient Egypt, and uh, you even look at places in ancient China, uh, you look at the Olmec monuments, you look at ancient South America, you look at all these giant megalithic blocks, could all of these cultures develop the ability to do this independently of each other, figure out how to move giant blocks? Maybe. Can they figure out how to uh, quarry them, cut them, transport them, and lift them into place on their own independently of each other? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Why do they all have iconography of people holding handbags? Though? Right, right, right. You know? That, that, this one thing is really, really hard to get around. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I'm very skeptical. I'm very pragmatic. <laughs> this, in some ways, it, it really blows my mind when I try to think about why is this appearing on such a well-carved, detailed Olmec monument where they carve the face off the monument. You know how they talk about in Gobekli Tepe? Gobekli Tepe is so exceptional because in Egypt, they carve their glyphs into the monument, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and they're chiseling out rubble right. to carve into it. On on Gobekli Tepe and the Olmec monuments, they pull the face off of the, off of the stone to reveal the glyphs underneath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's not seen everywhere in the ancient world, and right. they both show handbags. Right, right. And Gobekli Tepe is dated to a minimum of eleven thousand. Exactly, years exactly. Old. And this this is only this is only supposed to be three to four thousand years old. Right. So. It's interesting. It's why we're talking. It's, it's <laughs> insanely hard for me yeah. to explain that and understand yeah. it and to understand like if we were to find if we were to find a monument that looked exactly like this that wasn't in Turkey but say but say it was in Egypt or say it was somewhere in the Middle East maybe near the Euphrates or the Tigris River or something I would I would 100% be like yep no doubt about it absolutely there's a connection there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not as gung ho about it because it's so freaking hard to believe that, you know, Turkey is not only across the Atlantic Ocean, it's across the Mediterranean Sea as well. So for there to be a connection, it would have to go from through the Mediterranean, down through the Atlantic, through the Bahamas, through the Gulf Coast, all the way to the Olmec Coast. That's that's tough. You know, it's it's well, if you were if if mm -hmm. uh, if it was pre end of the last ice age mm -hmm. and um, the sea level was 400 feet higher, which we know it, it or 400 feet lower, mm -hmm. which we know it was. I mean, trans navigating the earth by foot would have been possible. You yeah. Would, you would have been able to walk from South America all the way to Turkey. To, yeah. 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 You know, um, so it. Yeah, it makes it interesting. And when the theory about the serpent there um, mm -hmm. potentially being a, if it was, you know, describing the younger Dryas with the comets, that's how people always describe, you know, with mm -hmm. using the, with the use of serpents. And I think we see that in the, um, you know, have to tell me, but the pyramid of the sun or the, it, it has the shadow of the serpents on the equinox. Oh, oh, the uh, uh, pyramid of Kukul Khan. There you so, go. Yeah. So Kukul Khan is just the Maya way of saying Quetzalcoatl. So okay. Quetzalcoatl, right is feathered serpent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> so could pot this could potentially be describing a cataclysm with with um with um you know the knowledge contained within mm -hmm. the handbag um sort of how they think potentially maybe that is in in um Gobekli tepe with the knowledge with the bringer of the knowledge after the great cataclysm and the serpent representing the comet with the cataclysm it if that were to ever be proven true i don't think it would i don't think it would surprise me yeah you know it's yeah. just there <clears throat> it's all speculation. Even, oh yeah, of course it's speculation. But yeah. what's so amazing about this is for anybody that knows anything about ancient Mesoamerica, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, Kukulkan, it's the same God, is 
the most enigmatic, most powerful, well-known, widely worshipped god of Mesoamerica. This right here dates back to around, it's between 900 and 1300 BC. This is, again, remote history, way out there in history at the very beginning. And it looked, and it's carved that well. The iconography is decided that well. Look at how intricate the hieroglyphs are made. Look at how stylistic the serpent is. You know, and that's not just a, that's not just a serpent. That's clearly, my opinion, that's a, that is a dragon. You know, so it's, it's now some kind of, it's gone beyond serpent to a mythical creature. This takes, in my opinion, (laughs) at least a thousand years to get to the point of this type of artistic ability in a culture. You know, you look at Egypt, takes, and my, I think it takes about a thousand years for them to get to the point that they're making hieroglyphs that look as nice as they are. So I would say there's at the very least, at the very least, as being as, as least uh, speculative as I can be, mm-hmm. there's a thousand years of ancient history before this monument is carved in Mesoamerica that we have not uncovered, that's still under the ground, that's still there. It's crazy. Um, and if not that, even more speculative, maybe that handbag, maybe there's something to that that connects it across the world. Could be. We see it in South America. Um, I think that maybe even on the, um, what's really weird is, uh, have you ever heard of the Toltecs before? Yeah. So the Toltecs are um, right next to Teotihuacan. Uh, right after the fall of Teotihuacan. The Toltecs are looked at in Mesoamerica as being very similar to Atlantis. Um, As far as the way that the Greeks and uh, some of the people after the Greeks looked at the idea of Atlantis as this this lost predecessor civilization full of of the wisest people on the earth, that that it was a, a perfect utopian civilization that once existed that people held in the highest regard, right? Mm-hmm. Toltecs are exactly like that. And they exist supposedly right after the fall of Teotihuacan um, and much, um, maybe around the time of the Olmecs as well, maybe a little bit after the Olmecs. We don't really quite know. Um, but they had this ancient city called Talan. And Talon was finally discovered just not that long ago, maybe maybe just 100 years ago. And what was really interesting is people looked at the Toltecs for several, no, it was less than 100 years ago, maybe within the last like half century or something. And um, and uh, archaeologists looked at the Toltec civilization. We could see the writings about it. The Aztecs talked to the Spanish about it. The Maya talk about the Toltecs. Toltecs are mentioned everywhere as ruling over the whole ancient world and having a utopian society. Um, have you have you ever heard of the book of the Four Agreements? Uh, I, I know a book, the Four Agreements. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, that's what it is. That's based on Toltec wisdom. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's all these prophecies from the Toltecs and how great they were. It's a really good book. There, there was no evidence that the Toltecs ever existed until they found the city of Talon. Huh, okay. At the city of Talon, there's there's two great giant pyramids there. And at the top of one of them are what is ominously called, and I can't find the origin of this name, they're called Atlantean statues. Hmm. And they are, have you ever seen the Mexican statues? that stand like they're giant stone totem poles. Have you ever seen yeah. this before? Yeah, yeah. Those are Atlanteans. And I have seen photos of some of them. I just thought of this yesterday when we were at dinner. Um, and I've just been diving into the Toltecs just here recently. I'm going to make a video on them at some point. Um, some of those guys are holding in their hand. It's eroded, but some of them look like handbags as yeah. well. And so you see that in Toltec civilization, which again is held in high regard, just like just it's similar in a way that Atlantis was in ancient Greece mm-hmm. and civilizations after following Greece. Um, so this handbag idea is um, it's really compelling and really hard to make a case against, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, especially after seeing a good Bitcoin Tepe. I mean, that that kind of was, you know, for me, that was a big one because of the age of that site. You know, we've yeah. seen it. You know, you could see a couple of coincidences, but but, but to go back 11,600 years and see it there was like, okay, what's what's going on? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, and the fact that it, the fact that it's irrefutably proven to be well, what's 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 crazy is so Gobekli Tepe is uh, officially discovered in uh, 1995, um, I think. 
Uh, yeah, right around. Yeah. There. yeah, and um, it's found by a farmer. What's interesting is farmers are the ones who find all these ancient sites. Right. The first Olmec site found by a farmer. Okay. Exactly the same thing. He's out prospecting his land. Ding, 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 ding. Hits a hits a Olmec head. Mm-hmm. Boom! A whole civilization is discovered. Mm-hmm. Exactly the same way Gobekli Tepe was discovered, and they have. They have the same art, right? You know, right. I mean, they carve their things the same way. Yeah. Um, just I don't know. It, yeah. It's crazy. Underground, intentionally buried. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, um, yeah, man, it's it's yeah. a, it's amazing. Um, you were talking about the altars, um, how the heads, um, were were um, kind of changed to altars. Yeah, stuff. yeah. So, so it's theorized. I think I have it here, but um. On the side, so you can see how the heads are like a little bit, um, they're not as as round or cylindrical as you would think that they would be. They're a little bit flat. And sometimes when they were laid on the side like this, they would be carved into an altar. So that ear right there would be turned into a, uh, that ear right there would be turned into the portal from where like an Olmec uh, man or ruler would be emerging out of some kind of portal or a cave. Mm -hmm. This may be possibly alluding or calling back to the origin of Olmec society. And what's really interesting is the very, very, very oldest Olmec reliefs, Olmec paintings that we find anywhere in the ancient world um, come from, uh, I forget the state in Mexico that it's in, but it's in the... uh, it's in the south central side of Mexico in the arid kind of mountainous deserts that are near the um, southern Pacific coast of Mexico. The problem is there's absolutely zero archaeology that goes on out there because it is a fortified cartel stronghold. There was okay. a there was a um, an American entomologist who was killed down there um, earlier this year. And but high up in those mountains are caves and patches of jungle where people have seen that there are ruins out there and there are caves with these Olmec paintings, but they're like pre Olmec. Just and uh, so I've talked to a friend of mine, NEXT, who he's working with an archaeologist who was just on um, he was just on Graham Hancock's show. He was the uh, um, I forget his name, but he was the archaeologist that took Graham Hancock to Cholula. Um, and uh, he's a real strong accent. If anybody's seen the show, they'll know who I'm talking about. Um, he and NEXT are working together, compiling evidence for a civilization that came before the Olmecs. Okay. But they're in this very obscure, very little studied part of Mexico that is a cartel stronghold. Mm-hmm. So there's no research going on there. Mm-hmm. And uh, people who go there, you know, they get taken advantage of and killed. Mm-hmm. So... It's uh, there's a lot of mysteries um, with the Olmec, and that's what makes them so fascinating. It is these giant monuments that they move with seemingly uh, no cultural history leading up to that. Um, and even if there is some cultural history, um, I, I mean, I've seen I've seen the evidence of 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 the earliest earliest Olmec writing, but it doesn't have anything to do with the construction and the movement and transportation of their monuments. It's like it's like it happens just like that. And it's, I think, in my opinion, it's the most striking, um, it's the most striking arrival of a civilization on the historical timeline anywhere in the ancient world. Okay. You know, like I was saying again in Egypt, there's a, you could argue that there's some time yeah. that leads up before the pyramids. Here, there's no time at all. Yeah. It happens from the very beginning. Hmm. And that's what makes the, that's what makes the Olmecs so fascinating in mm-hmm. my opinion. Mm-hmm. So one thing about the Amazon um, that's kind of like on our last podcast, we were talking about, uh, alternative theories to ancient Egypt. And I kind of have an alternative theory of, of the cult of the Pharaohs that purposely, um, safeguarded this, this sacred knowledge. I think I have an alternate theory to that. I haven't seen anybody else, uh, talk about in South America. So one thing that makes South, uh, ancient Peru so interesting to people are the megaliths that are there. And these are found in the regions of the four quarters. So the four quarters are the Inca world. Uh, It's the area that the Inca ruled. But the Inca only ruled for 150 years leading up to the time of the conquistadors' arrival. And during that time, they're thought to have built all the sites that they did. Now, to like a a layman person that, that doesn't understand just how many of these sites that there are, you know, um, I think like a lot of people who are enthusiasts, 
um, could name off Alante Tumbo, Sakse Waman, Cusco, Lima, Machu Picchu. You know, those are kind mm-hmm. of the main five. Mm-hmm. That's that's nothing. There's way more than that. Way more than that. There's there's so many that I've talked to Dr. Ed Barnhart about it before. Who's uh, he is a uh, South American archaeologist by by he's like an enthusiast, mm-hmm. but he's really a Maya archaeologist. But he's looked into this. He's told me without a doubt. There are multiple other Machu Picchus that haven't been found. Still, t- to this day, have not been discovered. And all of that was supposed to be done within 150 years. Yeah. And when the Spanish arrived in the when, a Span- when the Spanish arrived in the Inca world, they observed Inca people trying to move these giant blocks and failing to do so. And then they asked the Inca people who built these cities, and the and the Inca told them the city was always there. It was always there. They told them that it was built by the gods. The Inca never admitted to building these these cities whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So when archaeologists sit so uh, closely to the idea that the Inca did build these sites, when they literally said they did not, mm-hmm. makes no sense to me at yeah, all. I agree. And um, now am I immediately jumping to and saying that these are sites that were around at the end of the late Pleistocene into the Younger Dryas. I'm not immediately jumping to that, yeah. but I'm absolutely saying I feel 100% confident without a doubt that when you look at sites like Machu Picchu and you're looking at four walls and a foundation that are made out of five blocks mm-hmm. <laughs> and the blocks are three, two and a half, two to three feet thick made of solid solid granite, or even if it's limestone or basalt, it doesn't matter. They're that big, sitting on top of a mountain. And then the roof of the, of the structure is made up of two triangular walls that are made out of rubble and clay that, look, that looks like something that us three could go and build together right now. Right, right. It's, it's clearly, it's clearly a, a giant contrast in... Uh, in construction methods. And, yeah. and I just don't think that the builders who built the lower megalithic portions would settle for a roof that looks so primitive like it does. Right. And so when I try to think of a, an answer to this, something that's really pragmatic, really a reasonable answer to this, well, I end up looking at the civilization of Chavin de Hontar, which is... Uh, maybe just a couple hundred miles north of, of uh, let's say, where the Inca megalithic sites are. So Chavin de Hantar is built by the Chavin culture, but uh, around 1500 BC. Really interesting site that I haven't really seen anybody touch on. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think Ben's ever talked about it before. But I, th- I think he'd find some, uh, some interesting things there um, to look at. So right before Chavin de Hantar, you have the uh, Coral Supe culture which comes from the Valley of Pyramids that is on the uh, Peruvian coastline. And so they're basically building their pyramids right on the beach in the middle of the arid desert. Um, why they chose to build there of all, of all places, nobody knows. Um, we, I mean, we have a good guess of how old these things are. Like, I think, I think at any site, if I say that we know how old the site is, because of the bones that were dated there, it could easily be refuted like, well, why, how is that person not buried there later on? Right. You know what I mean? Right. I'm just kind of taking some of these things at, at face value. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, <clears throat> so, Coral Supe culture is building, according to the traditional historical timeline, they're building the first pyramids ever in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like mound pyramids that have roofs on top of them. They're, they're really cool structures. ton of rooms, and they build uh, over a dozen pyramids on the Peruvian coastline. And in a place that looks exactly like Egypt, I just don't know why people build civilizations in these arid places. Um, it's, it's really interesting. But they keep getting wiped out by these cataclysmic storms called El Ninos and La Niñas. And there's, uh, there's, if you've ever heard of something like it's El Nino season, mm-hmm. that means these like small hurricane storms are going to come in and hit the Latin American countries. Yeah, man, we're in Florida. And we know all about yeah, that. Yeah, of course, of course you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if there's a difference between just your typical hurricane and El Nino. Okay. I'm not sure if it is, a, if, if it's a different type of storm. Um, but um, so anyways, it's getting hit by these cataclysmic storms and just insane amount of flooding destroys their civilization. Very similar to all the cataclysmic events that we talk about. Mm-hmm. 
destroys their civilization over and over again. They keep on trying to rebuild. And these these guys are eventually, you know, after a few hundred years, are like, okay, I give up. We quit. Yeah, yeah we yeah. quit. We're retreating high up into the Andes Mountains uh, so we don't get hit by these storms anymore. And so they build this place called Chavin de Hontar uh, just a couple hundred years later. It, it rises to prominence. They probably started building immediately, but there's enough evidence of the um, of the habitation you know, that we know that it was, it was definitively there a couple hundred years later. And we know that it was the same people because we can test the DNA. It's the same DNA. It's also the same, um, it's also some of the same architectural types. So like the temples look similar. They're sunken plazas. Like they were building these sunken circular areas, I guess, where the community would gather. And the shape of the temple is like a U shape with a sunken plaza. It, there's a lot of similarities. What's not similar is they're not building pyramids any. They're not building pyramids anymore. They're building square temples. But now the temples have a complete interior. The whole temple is hollow and it's full of hallways and corridors and chambers and rooms that maybe acted as a palace or maybe they were um yep, so that's that's Shavin de Antar. And uh and this is like totally totally foreign in South America. The very first time that we're seeing temples being built that look like something that could have been built in Egypt or in the Middle East or something like that mm -hmm. with, with megalithic giant stones being used in the walls. And there, there's a gate leading up to, um, to Shavin de Hantar with, with cylindrical columns, just like you see in Egypt and, and in Rome with the cylindrical column that goes up and it holds like a massive megalithic stone above uh above the doorway we call that a lintel mm -hmm. this comes out of nowhere in in south america out of nowhere but what makes it really interesting is that chavin adopts the religion and the iconography of the amazon mm. at this time mm -hmm. so at the first time that we can watch the progression of a um, ancient South American civilization over the course of 1,500 years, as soon as they come into contact with the Amazon, they start building a megalithic stone. Mm. As soon as they take the Amazonian god, they start building it in megalithic stone. And Nobody else is talking about this? Nobody else is talking about this at all. Wow. They, uh, this is one of the first times in the ancient world that, that we begin seeing the depiction of the fanged deity. And it's a uh, it's a human jaguar god. What's really interesting is this is around around vaguely thirteen hundred to one thousand BC that Shavin arises, and we start seeing the depiction of humans that are like it's a half jaguar, half human in their in their iconography. Mm -hmm. At exactly the same time, the Olmecs start doing that. The mm -hmm. Olmecs and Shavin arise at the same time with very similar iconography, both worshiping half human, half jaguar gods. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I look at just a couple hundred miles south of that, and I look at these structures that are in the Inca realm that are even more impressive than Shavin, I think there's a few different potential answers here. My, my instinct though, is I think that it was built by a culture that was influenced by something coming out of the Amazon mm. and I think it predates the Inca by a long shot. Yeah. By a long shot. I think yeah. the Inca discovered a civilization, the, the ruins of a civilization that was once there. When that civilization existed, nobody can know. Mm -hmm. Nobody can be certain. It could be, so the Inca exists around 1300 BC to 1450, or I'm sorry, maybe like the late 1300s to the mid 1500s when they're eventually, you AD. know. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. AD, yes, mm -hmm. and um, and so could the. I mean, we don't have any historical um, acknowledgement of a civilization right there in the area where the Inca were prior to the Inca being there. Mm -hmm. So, in, and in my opinion, I don't think that the Inca built these lower megalithic structures in the cities that they inhabited. So I think that they were sitting in ruins for a long time, yep. potentially more than 2000 years. You know, the Inca are, the Inca are, are at their, are, ex the Inca existed 2000 years after Shavin. The sites that are in the Inca realm, I don't think were existing at the same time as Shavin because we would have seen 
if a, if a civilization was that advanced to build these structures, we would have seen the influence of that civilization on Shavin and on the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. So I think it was still in ruins then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far back it goes. Yeah. It could go back as far as uh, it could line up perfectly with, you know, 11,600 years ago. Yeah. It could, it could be as far back as 30,000 years ago because it, in the Amazon, on the uh, peripherals of the Amazon, we're finding uh, campsites and farms of ancient Amazonian people back in 30,000 uh, 30, years ago. Mm. So, uh, Based on carbon dating? Based on, based on carbon dating, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, uh, you can carbon date um, bones of, like, uh, like they had dogs and they had cats and there are graves out there. Um, but the main thing that we know is campfires. You okay. can find, right. you can find right. petrified wood with charcoal and date that. Mm -hmm. And so we know that it was humans, homo sapiens doing that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's crazy. So, but it's, it's just interesting that you follow the trajectory of, you have the Shaveen culture as soon as they take on the religion as soon as they're exposed to the Amazon, because Shavin is right next to the Amazon. Right. Once you go down the Andes Mountains, like you come down from the mountains, you're in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it, <clears throat> as soon as they're exposed to Amazonian culture, they start building in megalithic stones. And when, um, and when Spanish explorers are going down the Amazon, they're constantly documenting, seeing very fortified cities deep into the center of the Amazon. Because in the in the Western Amazon, um, it's all clay in the soil. So you have to get to the central Amazon over to the east, kind of up near Guyana, all the way down to southeastern Brazil. Now you're hitting bedrock where mm -hmm. people can can build stone cities. Mm -hmm. Well, the Spanish, um, when they're, you know, journeying um deeper and deeper into the Amazon, at the beginning, they're like, we're not seeing anything. We're not seeing anything. And all the tribes they were meeting were like, you have to go further. You have to go further. Well, they hadn't put two and two together. And I feel like I'm the only one saying this, you know, but like, um, it, it's clay. It was clay soil. That's why they weren't seeing these big cities that they wanted to see. There were villages there that had big mounds that they were, that they were, um, had their little like, uh, mount earthen and wooden temples on. But uh, the Spaniards wanted to see stone structures. Mm -hmm. So obviously, to us now, they had to go beyond where the clay soil was. So once they hit bedrock in the center of the Amazon, mm. they start seeing massive fortified cities with 50-foot walls surrounding the cities, and they were being attacked by these cultures. Mm -hmm. So undoubtedly, in my mind, the greatest mystery of all, my opinion, that that piques my interest more than, you know, Lost City of Atlantis is I think there is an Atlantis in the Amazon hmm. that spawned civilization out of all of South America that taught South American cultures to te to build in megalithic stone. Hmm. And I think it's I think it hasn't been discovered. And I think the Amazon was the perfect place to um once people built uh once they had um Gosh, what what's the soil type? Do you know the, the type of soil? I can't think of the name right oh, now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Terra something. Terra, uh, yeah, Terra Prada. Prada soil. Yeah. Once they invent, so that was an invention, mm -hmm. and they started cultivating the Amazon. And, what and, it is? Yeah, yeah. So Terra Prada soil, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know why I've been saying the word terracotta lately. Yeah, yeah. Terra Prada soil is I don't know quite all the science behind it, but um, the Amazon is known to a lot of people as like a green hell or a green desert. It is a place of, it is a very, very harsh climate to live in. And it's an endless cycle of natural sex and death, like rebirth and death. It is so hard for species to survive in the Amazon mm -hmm. that every snake and spider that lives there has evolved to be as venomous and as defensive as they could possibly be mm -hmm. because it's that hostile of an environment to live in. But once you invent terra preta soil, you can grow literally whatever you want in the Amazon because it just works perfectly with the soil there. So there were like, there's like gardens in the Amazon that are miles and miles and miles and miles long where they were harvesting all of the fruits and vegetables that they want. Not to mention there's an, yes, that's terra preta soil. It's like a very dark, rich black soil that the Egyptians would have loved to have. Right. The whole world. <laughs> yeah. The whole world would yeah. have loved to have. I mean, the, this would make the Egyptians jealous. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Egyptians were growing, uh, were growing grain and wheat, um, 
from grain and wheat and other plants uh, out of out of their so- out of their soil, the Amazonians were growing forests and jungles <laughs> yeah. full of full of like rich plant life and vegetables and fruit edible, that they would want. All edible. All 100% edible. Right. Definitely Crazy. were growing psychedelics as well. Oh, for sure. Absolutely yeah. were growing. Yeah. There are ayahuasca oh, trees that are six feet thick, uh-huh. you know, out there. <laughs> right. And uh, or ayahuasca vines, I mean. Yeah. And oh yeah, look how look how deep the terra preta soil wow. goes. So, wow. I mean, that's that shows thousands of years of cultivation right. using this type of soil. Right. And um and Which is th- like better than any soil we have today. Absolutely. I mean, and and man-made somehow. We don't know exactly how they. My understanding. Yeah. Is we don't know exactly how they came up with this. But. Well, there's some. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like after the soil has been in the ground this long, we know what it is, but we don't know. How, you can't like reverse engineer soil. You right. Know? I, right. I don't know the, the exact explanations behind it. Yeah. Um. But it's crazy. But it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so so you see here how um how the the tree lines are excavated and pushed back. Yeah. This is only happening on the peripheral of the Amazon. Right. So here's something to consider. When the Maya civilization and all of the ancient Americas collapsed, 100 million people had to die over the course of a few dozen years for us to have Thanksgiving, essentially. Um, there were There was 12 plagues of diseases that swept through the Americas and 100 million Native Americans died. And they died because many of them were living in massive cities, okay? So all of the harbingers of this ancient knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So you see where the, you see where those uh see where those yellow lines are streaking through? Mm-hmm. That's the center of the Amazon. So the uh conquistadors were coming from the Andes, those mountain that mountain range that's over there on the left. Mm-hmm. So think about how far right. they had to go through the rivers just to reach stone bedrock, which happens about halfway through the Amazon jungle, and it goes uh, even further over to the east. Mm-hmm. Only on the peripherals of the Amazon it, it, are we seeing these studies of terra preta soil. And there there are ruins of old cities that are there, but they're all earthen structures, they're like geometrical patterns in the ground. Um, it's all farming, agricultural land. So something to consider is that all the survivors, all of the people who who survived that knew anything that were able to continue the legends following the plagues that that swept through the Americas were your hermits that wanted nothing to do with society that lived on the outskirts. Mm. Okay. That's what we're seeing on the peripheral of the Amazon are people who, uh, all you guys with your giant cities deeper into the jungle, you guys can stay over there. We'll be out here near near the coast, near the ocean, where there's not as much jungle overhead. It's not so violent. We'll have our agricultural communities around here. Mm-hmm. So these are civilizations that we're seeing using that we know thus far use the terra preta soil, and it was definitely used everywhere in the Amazon. But as far as what we're excavating is our our civilizations, villages, towns that are on the peripheral of the Amazon that probably observed what was going on from a distance. We haven't like really gotten down to the meat and potatoes of what was going on yet. And I definitely think that Chavin de Hontar and all of these massive cyclopean and imperial uh, Inca ruins are remnants of, of something that the Amazon influenced in the Inca part of the world at some time that's completely indeterminable hmm. thus far. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, it could well, be 11,000. Sure. That's cr- That's a, that's a, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It could be 11,600 years ago. It could be, it could be 8,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. It, there's just no way of, there's no way of quite knowing. And it, it's, it's it, another thing that's really tough is the Spanish picked the Inca world clean. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's, if there was, if there was pottery and vases right. and, uh, gold, Gold, it was definitely gold. Yeah. Um, all of that was picked clean. You right. go, you go to, um, even you look at pictures of, like, if you go, if you were to go to Maya places today, and you would have been able to travel from town to town mm-hmm. much more easily back then, and, and know where where to go to get. Now it's all covered in jungle. And it's oh yeah, 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 yeah. They had they had highways. Right. I mean the right. the um even the Inca, it was something as like building highways at that point was yeah. well, I mean, maybe the Inca did do it. Um, I don't want to completely diminish their capabilities because they were master goldsmiths. Um, but but working gold is much easier than working granite yeah, and yeah. basalt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um 
but they um they were they were building massive highway systems all across uh south and central america right. that here, here spanish use these to come loot and pillage all yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah. and so when you go to like uh if we were to go to yashilan today and we were to walk around inside of the temples when you get a little bit away from just a, just a little bit away from where most of the tourists are walking around um you can go into a temple and there's still like maya scraps left on the ground that mm. people just don't touch mm -hmm. you know mm. little little you know sherds of pottery are are still on the ground of these temples there's uh in yashilan there's a temple that's not it's not hidden away it's just a little bit away from where like most people would walk around um but anybody who goes to visit yashilan could walk up into this temple and there's a maya board game just sitting on a uh just sitting on a bench inside this uh inside this temple mm. so when you walk around the maya world there's like little maya artifact there their presence there is very much defined mm -hmm. you know who really inhabited this area mm -hmm. you go to inca um you go to inca ruins and you walk around where these mega where these megalithic cyclopean imperial stones are at it's picked clean right, right. dude there's nothing there yeah. there's no pottery there's no art there's no nothing and um which i find so strange yeah that's weird um but you know uh, i think a lot of it was definitely from uh thousands of years of it being exposed and nobody is there safeguarding it so sure you have ancient indian south american people that are like hey man come check out this come check out all this city that's up here yeah. and they take stuff home with them and you know this could be 3000 BC that right. these these ruins have been sitting up there for who knows how long and there's little villages that live down at the bottom of the mountain next to the river and there's teenagers going up there picking stuff clean you know it, it just looks like it's been there my opinion when you look at ancient south america that looks like it's been there since the beginning of time yeah. you know mm -hmm. um and it's made out of the right type of stone to be there for that long um not all of it is limestone a lot of it most of it isn't limestone it's it's uh basalt and it's basalt and granite mm -hmm. and uh and that lasts forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. So, um, and it definitely doesn't show the signs of, of water erosion like limestone does. Yeah. So, I mean, you could have, you could have those ruins sitting up on top of the mountains in, in the Andes for 12,000 years and they look exactly the way that they do today. Yeah. So I could not even give a date. If the Inca didn't build those, I could, which I don't, I just really don't think that they did. Right. My gut tells me it's like as old as time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's yeah. no way to know how hey, man, far back it goes. Go back to Amazon 30,000 years, right? I mean, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's crazy. So yeah. well, let's talk a little bit about maybe because I know you got to go, you got to fight and you got to catch here. But but um, the, wall, the, the two things that I was interested in, mm -hmm. um, you know, are kind of the walls and the nubs. Okay. Um, yeah, just because of the, you know, just the incredible, as mm -hmm. long as we're exploring ancient civilization yeah. and some of the contradictions and, and some of the mysteries and question marks, you know, it's like the walls, maybe we start there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like like the what, what is it cyclopean and cyclopean and imperial. imperial uh or we're still talking about south america yeah okay so this is super cool so you have these you really have three different types of of, of walls you have cyclopean you have these large pillowy stones that uh that puff out at right. the end that that almost look like uh like dr barnhart he talks about it like if you packed a bunch of uh if you packed a bunch of cinnamon rolls together and yeah. you heated them up in the microwave and then they inflate against each other and they're pressing against each other, that's what it looks like. It's totally unnatural. Yeah. Um, and it's 100% confirmed that these are not, um, and uh, there you go. Cool. Yeah. So I think this is Alante Tumbo. And uh, so look at that. Look at that stone there um, almost just to the right. And that's granite or what, what is that? I think that these are basalt. basalt. Okay. I believe that they're basalt. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um I think that the I think that what I'm learning is the granite stones are the imperial style. Okay. Um and um and we'll get to that in just a but second too. Almost as hard as granite, which we Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basalt's yeah. about a six on the Mohs. Yeah, yeah. So just 
barely uh, softer or right. whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So these, this is kind of a mix of Cyclopean and Imperial, mm -hmm. um, but you can see the nubs on there. Right. These are a little bit more modest size blocks, but these Cyclopean blocks can be upwards of 20 feet tall. But the top, you know, if it's 20 feet tall, there's 12 feet of it sticking out of the ground, yeah. eight feet of it under under the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's insane is nobody in South America knew what a horse or an ox was, probably at the time that these were being constructed. We have no evidence that that beasts of burden, large beasts of burden to be able to move um to be able to move uh, loads like this existed in the new world prior to Columbus. What's the mainstream explanation for like how they were cut and placed? And moved? absolutely no explanation. No explanation. <laughs> I mean, no explanation. Yeah. It's it's just kind of like it's kind of like one of those things that they don't really look at it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's over here, like this light, it's glaring at me in my eyes. Yeah. Kind of just don't acknowledge yeah. it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's it. There's yeah. no um, you know, and, and what's insane is that when the um they don't want to say flint chisels and founding stones uh, i guess they just get made fun of yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and um and That's so true. and so there was a um this might be i think there's there's something called the uh the temple of lima and there was a um a spaniard who was standing outside the temple of, of lima and he was talking to some of the inca people about the imperial blocks and he said, he said, how did you do this? And they were like, they're like, well, this is always here. Mm -hmm. the, the gods built this, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so it was there long before they were ever there. But um, um, what's this? so anyways, um, so you have these two different types of, of stones. You have cyclopean, which can be, you know, upwards of 20 feet tall, sometimes six feet tall, but they're also like six feet deep. Right. And and both styles of, of stonework architecture here, each stone, they're never made uniformly, like where, where they all have the same measurements. Right. The stone, Every stone's the stone is made to fit next to the stone it's going to sit next to. Yeah. And then the next stone is made to sit next to that. Right. And then the other stone is made to fit on top of it. And another stone is made to fit in the back. And each angle, either on five or six sides, is made perfectly to fit along the block it's going to get next to you. And what the heck is the logistics of that? Right. And you why? Know? And, like, and, why not just make them square? I, yeah, mean, I guess yeah. anti-seismic potentially, but... Well, definitely anti-seismic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, in these uh, in these giant Inca... Um, so like the walls that we just showed, the Cyclopean walls at, at Alente Tumbo, yeah. they have a soft, quote unquote, foundation that's made out of rubble. And so when there's earthquakes, because there's earthquakes all the time in the Andes, it shakes the whole... Um, it shakes the whole structure and it allows the structure to move back and forth and then it settles back down into uh -huh, place. Uh -huh. So the very odd, um, it's kind of like when we were talking on the last episode, we were talking about Senefru's first pyramid. Yeah. All the blocks were too symmetrical. So the sides just slid off the right. pyramid and crumbled down the side. And that's right. why you see the core of the pyramid still sitting there. So when you make the blocks you know, kind of like Lincoln logs and they're all leaning against each other in really odd places, it locks the uh -huh. the structure uh -huh. in together. Uh -huh. right. And then right. So right. The, the whole pyramid is locked together and then the foundation is soft. So the pyramid, so it's not like the blocks are moving against each other. The whole thing stays together and the whole wow. structure moves on its own That's and settles back into place. And this has been shown um, in full effect twice since uh, Europeans have been have been present in South America. It happened in 1650. They they tried to tear the ancient city of Cusco down. So Cusco, yeah, look at this block. Look at this block right here. Yeah. How is that even possible? It, it, it right. The the logistics of doing something like this to uh I believe that this right here is granite. Okay. I mean I mean Right. That's be that's almost beyond this. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and to build as many cities as they did like that, which what is this granite diorite? But yeah. um, it's pretty similar to this to build entire cities with that kind of precision with, you know, how they say with the Great Pyramids, you can't pluck a hair off of your head and stick it between the blocks. Right. It's more true here. Right. Right. So and and the, and and I think I heard you say um, 
um, that uh, mm-hmm. that that there's been earthquakes. So the the 1650, um, the Spanish tried to tear it down, but then there's yes. earthquakes that that have uh, yeah. that have knocked down more modern cities when mm-hmm. the ancient stuff is still standing. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So in 1650, um, there was an earthquake that shook the city of Lima, and uh, the Spanish tried to. Uh, shook the city of Cusco and the Spanish tried to tear the city down and the blocks were too locked in together. They couldn't do it. That's all. So they built Spanish structures on top of it. 1650 and knocked the city down. Then in 1950, 300 years later, another earthquake knocked the whole city down. Both times the city of Cusco is still standing there. Look at that's three different levels of walls right there. Yeah. And these stones are brought it, they're not quarried from there. They're brought from a quarry on a different mountaintop through the valley, through the rivers, up on top of this mountaintop to build this to build this wall here. How many miles? Um, well, it's different. And, and yeah. There's so many different sites that I, I'm not sure yeah, the particulars, yeah. but in sometimes, um, in sometimes it's as little as five miles. Yeah. But you look at it and it's straight down a mountain. Straight across a river straight up the other mountain right. and how are they dragging that much weight up a mountain there's so many questions and like absolutely and, and nobody knows nobody knows and then and then like the um like the the fact that the incas were working in this style supposedly mm-hmm. right and building this but then we also see the same style right cyclopean mm-hmm. uh, walls we see that uh, who else was making them where else do we see that well we see stuff that's similar ish to that in greece and rome but it's not the same it, it's yeah. just not the same kind of precision um cyclopean is pretty unique to um cyclopean is pretty unique to ancient peru there's some things that we see on cyclopean blocks that we see in some other places um there are some cyclopean blocks that are um that are made of granite that are a little bit smaller i think the massive cyclopean blocks like these are made of basalt Mm-hmm. But the cyclopean blocks that are pillowed out um, that we see in Peru, what's really interesting is on the Mancure Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, those casing stones are granite and they're cyclopean. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. strange is that? Mm-hmm. And they look, it, you know, how you, have you ever seen the scoop marks in ancient oh, yeah. Peru? Yeah, yeah. Those ben names, did a great video on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those same scoop marks can be seen on the casing stones on the Mancure Pyramid. Huh. So, that's amazing. Like that, that directly, um, using, I have to be careful about using the word connects, but yeah. y- there's a direct, um, uh, a direct similarity between ancient Peru and, and, uh, and one of the great pyramids. Yeah. Look at that. How amazing is that? Hey, one, one that'd be really c- cool to look up is look up a 12 sided, uh, Inca block. And you'll see a block that has 12 sides on it. And I believe it's uh, about a foot thick. It's it's an imperial um, stone. And uh, yeah, man, there's... Um, okay, so as far as imperial uh, construction, we see the exact same sort of style of construction, um, definitely in Egypt. Um, but I would say Egypt is the other best example of that. You know, uh, as far as ancient stonework of building uh, walls, mm-hmm. Egypt and Egypt and ancient Peru. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, okay. That that stands above the rest of the ancient world. There yeah. really, um, there may be there may be some. Yeah, look at this twelve sided stone, and it has a nub on it, and it has scoop marks. Uh-huh. <laughs> how <laughs> nuts! It. How nuts is that? Yeah. And that is on the uh, that's on the Temple of Lima, I believe, and. This the Spaniard um, who was here was looking at this, and he was talking to the Inca people, and he said, "He said, how did you guys do this? I've I've never seen. I'm not seeing you guys building these walls." And uh, that's when he was told that that they've always been there. Yeah. The Spanish yeah. never ever saw the Inca build these structures. Yeah, yeah. And the Inca were only around for 150 years. Right. And um, the amount of cities that they built. I mean, there's there's something that could be looked up that I've never seen. Ben or anybody else talk about. I just I just saw this on a lecture. Um, it was called uh, the Emperor, the Inca Emperor's Palace. You can look that up. Made out of purely uh, imperial granite blocks and perfectly square, um, sitting up on top of a mountain, totally picked clean. There's nothing there that that resembles any kind of culture. It's just architecture. Mm-hmm. And um, and man, in the ancient Andes and in ancient Egypt are the two places that you see something like that. So when I dive into this conversation, it's like, 
glaringly obvious why people would assume that there's a yeah. connection there. And I don't yeah. think I don't like uh I don't think that's completely unreasonable at all. Yeah. Um I'm hesitant to assume a connection, but in some cases it's just so strikingly similar. In those nubs you were talking about, they're found gosh, let's think about it. They're found in Chavin de Hontar. They're found in they're found in Teotihuacan. Um so Chavin de Hontar, I'll, I'll give you the the proposed dates of them too. Chavin de Hontar is um, 1300 to 1000 BC. Teotihuacan is anywhere from, uh, let's say, 600 BC to 580, something like that. Um, ancient Peru, gosh, 1400 AD, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's real, that's real recent. Mm -hmm. um, but then you go back to Egypt and you see nubs in Egypt that go back to 1500 BC to 2500 BC. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you go back to ancient India and you can see nubs that are there from, uh, a 1500 AD all the way back to 5,000 BC, right. you know, supposedly is when they say that these, these are there. You even see ancient nubs in, um, you see them in China, yeah. you see them in ancient Japan. So yeah. what is that? What is that? I right. have no idea, right. you know? In, in Greece as well. I know that you see them in Greece too. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. So it's like, what's going on? Because because if there was like, there's no explanation for what they were used for. I mean, or like how like people there's say, no oh, definitive explanation. Maybe ropes, or maybe used to like you know pull them around, yeah, or to, to put them in place, or potentially for scaffolding. But there's no rhyme or reason with the nubs, like in terms of how they're placed on all these various walls that would account for like scaffolding as a as no, an no, 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 no. And that and like we were talking about last night, that would be obvious, if, right. if they were all scaffolding, right. If there was, we wouldn't be talking about it. I yeah. Mean, it's a mystery. It's it's odd. And it's one of those globe spanning mysteries mm -hmm. that, that people just that we don't have a great answer to yet. It, what what I would think when you look at when you look at the insane range of dates between what the nubs are, um, I think they're definitely functional because they're not natural. Mm -hmm. So and how they were made, gosh, it's like that's a whole other thing. Because when you think about a nub, like you immediately think like like you could you know, you could pinch something into being a nub, but no, the surface was removed so that the nub could be there. Right, right, right. What the yeah. heck is that? What's going on? And um, so you see that all across the ancient world. And so the pragmatic uh, in me thinks, okay, well, it definitely came from somewhere. And then the knowledge of that was carried down throughout various places. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that it's on two different continents and ocean apart from each other is one of those things like the handbag. Did these two civilizations on different sides of the planet come to the same realization of the use of nubs and how to create them completely independently? Right. Really? Right. Yeah, doesn't make really, sense. and they you and they have handbag symbolism as well. Right, right. So it's kind of like, it's kind of I don't know what the exact answer is, but I think the answer is somewhere in between. It's all well. I mean, this is obvious, but it's somewhere in the middle of uh, oh, it's all a coincidence, and this is an ancient Atlantean alien civilization that was completely interconnected throughout the world. Yeah, there's some there's something to that. Um, but I just, I don't, I couldn't even begin to, no. to theorize exactly uh, uh, the answer to all of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know you got to go. <laughs> yeah, so I know you got to go. I know you got a plane to catch. Um, uh, but but if you could, just just like, um, if you can stay for like five more minutes, I'd love to just ask you yeah. about uh, Tiwanaku and the H blocks that we see out there. Yeah, yeah. The, the incredible precision that we see on those H blocks is like, like what? What's going on? How are those possibly? What? First off, is there an explanation on on those? I mean, you see drill holes through them. You see like mm -hmm. perfect right angles. Oh yeah, perfect right angles and in the layering of angles as well. So, um, perfect right angles in these really strange shapes. So that that is the gateway. Um, that's the gateway of the sun. So it says fourteen hundred years ago. Um, although I don't know that I outright believe that. Yeah. Um. Because so, it, it looks like like a catastrophe. I'm sorry, but it looked yeah, yeah. like like some major catastrophe happened. Blew there. it apart. Like just blew everything apart. And nothing yeah. like that's happened within the last 1400 years that I'm aware of. And no, America, no, no, right? no, absolutely not. And and there would be uh, obviously evidence of of that if it wasn't a bomb, right? You know? Right. So um, and there's no evidence that the Spanish launched cannons at 
at the site of Tiwanaku. Right. Um, Everybody <clears throat> I hear says it looks like water, like a massive wave went through there. And then, and then you look at like um, Salar de Uni, the the big massive um, salt deposit that's mm -hmm. in South America. And you think about, you know, if if the ocean was coming from west to east, and and you know, it went, and that's kind of where the it would have settled at that point and left that yep. salt. You know, could it have been the same event that potentially uh, blew this place up? Mm. So, it, I mean, I think that that. It sounds reasonable. I'd have to look into it more. Um, the H blocks are probably one of the strangest, uh, you know, structure formations that I've ever seen. Yeah. I have seen people go in. Um, Ryan, you could look up. Uh, you could look up virtual recreation of H block temple or something like that. I've seen people um, do like a drone scan of all of these uh different it's almost like it's like a puzzle of pieces that yeah. have some kind of purpose they used to go together i'm sure because they look like they're just blown apart mm -hmm. i have seen people recreate um one or two temples using these blocks just trying to reverse engineer it and put it together and, and, and create a building from it and the examples that i've seen it, it in complexity it's beyond anything in ancient south america mm anything at all mm. um tiwanaku culture also you know you know where their god comes from the amazon okay. it's the same god as shaveen de Hontar. Oh, it's okay. the fanged jaguar deity okay. that we know comes from the amazon because you can follow pottery in graves with the same iconography going back further in time the deeper you get into the jungle mm. so in the reverse of that is people are dying and uh, this iconography of pottery is coming out of the Amazon and all of a sudden it interacts with a culture that's in the Andes outside of the jungle so we can see the ruins, boom, building a megalithic stone. Mm -hmm. So so now that's so now that's two cultures. But this is in complexity is almost more remarkable than than some of the Inca uh, you know work because what would have possessed them to make a block that looks like that? Right, right. <laughs> you know, right. Um, and so what I've seen is, is uh, so these are pretty large blocks. Maybe they're about half as tall in height as a person. So you stack a couple of those on top of each other, and then they've taken some other blocks and used them as as the ceiling. So yeah, you can see that. You see those two H blocks are standing on top of that platform looking yeah. thing? That's called Platforma Lytica. That is 165 tons, and it was brought from somewhere else. It's not natural to... To that area, yeah. Not one piece. It's one piece. Oh my god. Yeah, and um, and that's like at the top of a mountain, isn't that like the? It's it's, like it's elevated. It's very elevated, uh, but it's between two mountains. Okay. So it's very high above, um, the water level or the ocean level. Yeah. But it's between two other mountains okay. as well. Okay. So the wow, look at that. So it looks like it's completely blown apart, but I think that they used to um. I mean, look at that. Holy crap. Crazy. It, it's mind-bending. And the only thing I can think is that this is something that it is, you know, look at that platform right there. Yeah. that That's not platform Elytica, but it's huge. Mm -hmm. And these are moved from somewhere else. So that's the platform of a giant temple that it looks otherworldly. If, if you could find something where people recreate what they think the temple may have looked like, it's not like anything else that you see in ancient South America. Where this influence came from to build something that looks like this can't be explained any other way than from somewhere in the Amazon. Because mm -hmm. it's not to the west, because to the west you find, uh, to the west of Tiwanaku, you get into, so Tiwanaku's in, in Bolivia, you get into Peru where you see the Cyclopean uh, imperial sized or imperial blocks. It's not similar at all to, mm -hmm. to what we see in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And the only explanation is that it came from from the Amazon just right to the east uh, mm -hmm. of them. Um, yeah, look at that. So that's what they think that it lo would have looked like. But look, at, see how the H blocks are are stacked up. Yeah, it's just. That's I mean, man, that looks like something. That looks like a a Mesopotamian Babylonian temple on steroids. Yeah, you know, yeah. made out of made out of megalithic stones. It's just. It's just inexplicable. I, I wish I had a better explanation, but the but look at look how big this one is. So these are on top of the platforms, and so all those H blocks and these long um, monolithic megalithic stones that you see were, I think, likely used to build a temple that probably looks something similar to this, and just blown apart. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. 
I, it doesn't look like it was systematically taken apart to me. It looks blown apart. There's no, uh, there's no rhyme or reason to its deconstruction. You know, yeah. looks very similar to Tanis Egypt. Have you ever seen? Have yeah. you ever seen that oh, yeah. before? Yeah. Speaking of blowing up, yeah. 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 Well, and, and in uh, in uh, is, it, is it Exodus, I think that um, God says that He's going to um, He's going to cast His judgment on the gods of Egypt. He's going to bring the plagues to Egypt. And he's going to cast his judgment on, I believe, Zoan. Mm -hmm. And Zoan translates to Tanis. And he said he was going to rain hell on Tanis. Mm -hmm. And you look at Tanis from uh, from Google Earth point of view, and it is a burn mark in the Nile Delta mm -hmm. with completely um, torched soil. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I could I can't explain it, but it's strikingly similar to Tannis, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Well, speaking of blowing up, um, your YouTube channel's been blowing up. It's yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, it's been awesome to uh, to chat with you. Um, I, you know, I, if anybody wants to follow you, I, I'd highly recommend it. You got some Thank incredible, you. incredible information on your channel. Um, Luke Caverns. Uh, thank on, you, man. On, on YouTube, yeah. And, yeah, thank uh, you so yeah. much. And if anybody wants to join me in uh, in uh, going to see some Maya ruins, I'm leading a tour with my friend Next, who you got to have on someday when he's in the states. For sure, yeah. uh, he's an he's an Egypt uh, he's an Egyptology specialist and, and an expert. Um, I'm leading a I'm leading a tour with him to the Yucatan March 17th through the 23rd, and uh, we're going to be seeing Chichen Itza, Uxmal, uh, a lot of late classic sites. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to have you back on the show, man. There's so much more that I want to ask you. I mean, I feel like we're just yeah. kind of scratching the surface yeah. here, but... Um, well, it sounds like I'll be back in maybe a couple months. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. I really enjoyed this. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, man. You got to hit the road, brother. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Great to talk to you, man. Thank you, man. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much. Yep. Good times. Oh, man, that went well. Yeah, that was great. That was great. You killed that, man. That theory is amazing. That's like... The Amazon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, there's nobody talking about I know, that. I know. It's um, crazy. I guess it's, it seems so logical. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. It, it seems logical. And, uh, and I, you know, I guess an extension on the back end of that theory that I didn't explain was uh, that can still tie into... A world spanning oh yeah global sure. civilization yeah. it's just uh that i think that those inca ruins are an offshoot i think it's definitely an offshoot of something that was going on in the amazon mm -hmm. and whatever was going on in the amazon hell it might be connected to some world spanning civilization because yeah. that can go back thirty thousand years yeah. and even graham hancock has has proposed lately that the key to earth's lost civilization could be somewhere in the Americas, maybe yeah. in the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's, yeah, that's it's, crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, that's super cool. Super cool.